Uh, we've been in a sermon series called Villains. Uh, we're going to continue in that this morning. Uh, if you didn't, weren't able to join us, Pastor Nathan kicked it off talking about Judas, Judas the betrayer, and how uh, we all have the ability uh, at moments in our life to get mad at God and want to betray him, to leave, to get away from. Uh, but we need to have a heart of love. We need to have a heart of love. We need to be able to forgive and forget and to move on. Maybe we, were, we talked a little bit about Pharaoh, Pharaoh the intimidator, uh, full of pride and arrogance, full of control, and how God broke him, and through his brokenness, we too can be broken as well uh, to be a vessel and a witness for the Lord, just like Moses was. And today we're going to talk about Saul, Saul the judgmental, judgmental. That's a, that's a word that is thrown around quite a bit, judging, judging, and we're going to break that word down. And so what we want to find out today is this uh, self-righteousness versus the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you this morning for your presence. God, we need you. And I'm asking, Lord, that you fall afresh upon us. Lord, you speak to us. Help us to push pause, not worrying about tomorrow. We're focusing on the right now. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. So, judging. You know, I remember back when I was playing ball, I had a moment of just being separated from the game for a season. And just like uh, many players would do, we'd go pick up an odd of end jobs until we get picked up again because we got to keep the income coming in some way, somehow. And a friend of mine that played with me, uh, we decided to, 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 to work for a guy in the church. He had a framing company. Anybody know framing houses? That's what we did. We framed houses. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't even know what a hammer looked like. You know, we never touched it. We used to play with a football. So now we're in this multi-million dollar home that we framed up through wood. And we're out there swinging this hammer and being stupid. We got these guns, you know, these nail guns shooting each other with these nail You know, just don't know what we're doing. It was fun, though. And then all of a sudden, at the top of the house, there was this guy looking down on us. And he was yelling at us, and he said this. We had our worship music on, by the way, you know, just listening to the Lord, praising God. And all of a sudden, he looks down, and he goes, hey, do you guys like rock and roll? I looked at him. I'm like, man, I am listening to all rock and roll, man. You know, I'm more a hip-hop dude, but I'm listening to Jesus right now. And he shouts back again, hey, do you guys like rock and roll? And so I kind of looked back again, and I got a real good look at him. He had a long beard. Had a little biker jacket on, biker boots, and you know, had the little chain going. And so I'm thinking, uh oh, this might not turn out too good. And then uh, me and my friend, I looked at him, I said, hey, look, man, you take the low part, I take the high part just in case it gets bad in here, because we might have to fight. I don't know what this guy's about. He said it a third time, hey, man, I asked you a question. Do you like rock and roll? I'm like, man, I just told you I ain't feeling that, brother. And then all of a sudden, he comes down, he says, hey, I'm getting a roll down there right now, and I'm getting ready to give you my testimony about my rock, Jesus Christ. And I looked at him, I was like, oh my gosh. And this man begins to go through all the heartache and all the pain and everything that he's ever gone through before he came to Christ and how God did a miracle. See, he owned the framing, he owned the, uh, the, the roofing company that was doing the framing of the house. And so in my heart, I left driving home that night, and I was like, man, I judged him. I judged him. I looked at the outward instead of the heart. And that's how me and you can be at times. We can look at people on the outward appearance and we can say all this negative stuff about people, but God looks at the heart. And so today we're going to look at a man by the name of Saul who was out judging people. He was full of self-righteousness. And we're going to break this, uh, er, this verse down. And we're going to see what God has to say about being self-righteous. The Bible in Acts chapter 9, 1 through 6, if you can go there uh, with me right now. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to a high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, were men, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he heard, as he neared Damascus. On his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse five, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Who is Saul? Saul of Tarsus 
was a Jew, a tribe of Benjamin, born in the city of Tarsus, which would be modern day Turkey, but raised in Jerusalem. His parents were Roman citizens, so through birth, he had Roman citizenship. He trained in the Torah, went to the universities of Tarsus under the most respected rabbi of the first century, Gamaliel. Saul considered himself to be zealous for God and a Pharisee. He was a tent maker by trade, and he became good friends with the Sanhedrin persecuting attorney. Saul, growing up with full of knowledge and wisdom, but yet it was lacking something. It says that Saul was out breathing murderous threats. Who is he breathing murderous threats against? He was breathing murderous threats against those who have converted uh, uh, to follow Jesus Christ. See, Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And it says that they were of the way. And so Jesus, excuse me, he, uh, Saul was upset because, man, these people are being pulled away from the doctrine, from the law, the things that we were talked about, uh, that Sam was saying up here about from the Torah. And so they were, he was upset and was angry and said, man, there was one person who was kind of leading the charge at the time in this, and his name was Stephen. And Stephen was a layman, a deacon, if you will. And Stephen was up there full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, had gotten caught up in this, this tension between the law and being the follower of the way. And Saul hated people that were like that. Any man, any woman, any person who got in the way of the law, anybody who would try to pull people away from that, he was ready to kill. And it says that he drugged this man out and they began to challenge him in his belief. And Stephen, it says, just stood up in peace and calm. And I need you to understand this full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. See, you can have a bunch of head knowledge, but be no earthly good. And he had a bunch of head knowledge, Saul did, but he was no earthly good. See, the Holy Spirit began to speak through Stephen in such a way where nobody, not even the Sanhedrin, not even the high priest, not even Saul himself could, could compete with what Stephen was saying. And it made Saul furious. And he said, you know what, I'm dragging this man out. And what I'm getting ready to do, I'm going to make sure that every person who chooses to follow Jesus, I'm going to make sure that this is be their punishment. So what did he do? He said that they stoned Stephen. What is stoning? Stoning is when people will pull you out and they begin to pelt stones at you. And they would throw these stones at you until you would die. Anybody like baseball in here? Anybody baseball fans? Come on. Baseball, Met fan, Yankee fan. Don't say it in front of each other, you know, just you know, one, of, one or the other. Well, in baseball, you know, you see these pitchers, man, and they can work the, those baseballs, right? You ever see them get behind a gun, and they, 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 what they'll do is they'll see how fast he's throwing, and every once in a while, somebody get up in that 101, 102 mile per hour throwing that ball, and then sometimes a pitcher will get so excited, or maybe he'll lose the grip of the ball, and it'll get out of his hand, and all of a sudden, it'll hit that pitcher or to hit the catcher, or to hit the baseball, and it hit the one that's swinging the bat. And all of a sudden, it'll catch him. And I remember watching a baseball game where the ball got loose and hit him in his face, and, man, the whole place just, oh, my gosh. But could you imagine that's what they're doing to Stephen? They're taking their best aim, throwing these stones at him until he'll die. Saul, full of self-righteous because of where he studied and who he was around, felt that he knew better. Anybody ever been in a situation where you feel that you know better just because you've gotten a degree, because you've lived a certain lifestyle, or you have something in your bank account, you begin to look down on people, and that's what Saul was doing. Why was Saul so mad at people that acted a certain way other than the way? He got mad because he felt that they were pulling people away from the law, and as they're pulling people away from the law, what was really happening is they're being convicted. See, Jesus did what others wouldn't do. Jesus spent time with sinners. Jesus spent time with poor people. And it was causing the Sanhedrin and the high priest, it was causing them all of a sudden to be lose the credit because they looked down upon those people. And Jesus was winning people, even people that were studying in the synagogue. He's winning these people. And no, no, we can't allow them to steal people and pull them away from the law. That's self-righteousness. Being holier than thou. No, we have to protect the law. But what I want to say to you in my first point is this, is that we need to check ourselves. 
We need to check ourselves. We need to check and analyze our hearts and see if there's anything going on that may be opposite of who God is. See, in his mind, he's validating himself. Anybody ever try to validate the thing that we're doing, but we're inside God is saying it's wrong? See, here it is. Saul is sitting here trying to validate. Well, I remember Moses slaying the Immor Israelites at Baal Peor. I remember Phineas slanging uh, the Israelite men and Midianite women in the place of Moab because they weren't obeying the law. So in his mind, he's thinking he's done right. But in his heart, he's doing wrong. The Bible says this in Psalms 139, 23 through 24. He has his, uh, excuse me, that was the wrong verse. I was about to preach something that sounded good but wasn't right. It says, search me, O God, know my heart, test me in my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Search my heart. Search my heart, Lord, to see if there's any elitism. Search my heart, Lord, to see if there's any bigotry or racism. Search my heart, Lord, to let me know if I'm looking down upon any man or anybody. See, they felt if you don't know, didn't know their way, then you were a nobody. If you didn't do it their way, then you were considered a nobody. And so it brings me to this point here. There's the difference between Target people and Walmart people. Is there any Target people in here? No, let's be real, because it might cause a church split right now. Any Target people versus Walmart people. Target people, let's just say how it is. Target people, you know, walk around, you know, oh, this is so nice. And, uh, and then you look down on the Walmart people. The, you, you, the, them rollback people, man, they, it's all nasty and ugly in there. I, you know, this whatever, whatever. And, you know, but, but you know what, man, there's something about a Walmart. Per- I'm a Walmart person. I'm sorry. My wife's a target person. My daughters are target people. So there's conflict in our home. And they're always looking down on me. But that's okay. I'm okay because I know that if I was to get in a fight, I want some Walmart people with me. I don't want no target people with me. I don't want no people that, you know, oh, I don't want to touch that. Oh, that's just a- no, no, I want some people that's going to throw down. And so there's a difference between Target and Walmart people. Why? Because Target people, now I'm not going to beat y'all today. I'm going to leave y'all alone. <laughs> no, the, they were looking down upon them because they were doing things that they knew was right and they should have been doing. They were hanging out, the people of the way with the poor. They were hanging out with the down and out. They were hanging out with people and this was convicting them. And it's doing things in them. And it caused them to, hey, man, I need to check myself. I need to go back and analyze and make sure that what I'm doing is right. Could you imagine being Saul? Anybody ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit? I mean, real conviction, not that fake stuff. I'm talking where it's just like, man, I'm uncomfortable because of what I said about somebody or how I looked at somebody. Anybody ever had that conviction? Okay, I'm just making sure y'all hear this morning. Y'all quiet. This is a heavy word, I know. Put this one on me. I'm like, man, I could have preached something was happy today. No, we're going we to have to talk about this. Could you imagine being Saul in his studies, thinking, man, I'm, I'm learning the law. I'm looking in and out. I, I know the Old Testament. I'm Gen X, the Vedicate number, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Joshua. I'm all in this. I know the, the law. I know what it means. You heard Sam say 600 uh, ways of doing things. I, I know every one of those. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts convicting them. Man, you, you just killed an innocent man. See, Stephen, when he was being martyred, he did opposite of what most people did. He said he looked up to heaven and he said this, man, I I see the Lord Jesus sitting at the right hand of the father in power. He said his angel was like his face was like an angel, innocent, pure, full of life, full of love. And he turns and he looks at all the people as they're throwing stones at him. He's getting ready to breathe his last breath. And he says, Father, forgive them. Saul never seen anything like that ever happen. You ever do something wrong to somebody that you know was wrong and all of a sudden they forgive you anyway? Conviction. What I said was wrong, how I acted was wrong, what I did was wrong. Man, I got to go back and I need to check myself. And could you imagine Saul just sitting there pouring over the scriptures, but in his mind he's having those playback and replay. I've never seen a man like that. There was something different about him. Oh, man, I don't know if this is right. See, the Holy Spirit will get inside of us and begin to convict us of the sin, the righteousness, and the judgment to come. He'll begin to rearrange some things deep inside of our hearts. See, the Bible says in Matthew 7, 5, you hypocrite. First, get the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly and take the speck out of your brother's eye. Before I can check somebody else, I got to check myself. Before I can call somebody else out, I got to make sure I'm called out first. 
I got to make sure, man, what's really going on in my soul? What's my motive? Do I really do this out of love or is this out of self-righteousness? Am I doing this to be seen or am I doing this for the Lord Jesus Christ? What's really going on down in my soul? What's really going on? Battling thoughts and actions and deeds. And so Paul, instead of just dealing with this, Saul, instead of just dealing with this stuff, man, it, it makes him even more angrier. And he says, man, I'm going to go get not just women and not just men, but I'm getting children as well. And I'm compelled to make sure that these men and women blaspheme God. I'm compelled to make sure that they're sent to death. I'm making sure that these men and women will no longer stand up for the way, but they're going to come and do it our way. Pharisees and Sadducees. It's the people of the Sanhedrin giving them full backing to go and do what needs to be done. But I know this about our God. And I know this. And my second point is this, is that you better be careful who you mess with. See, the Bible says that do not touch my chosen people and do not hurt my prophets. Do not touch my chosen people and do not hurt my prophets. See, there's moments when we don't know who we're messing with. And so Saul on this road to Damascus and Damascus to where he was headed. All of a sudden, man, it was 150 miles. And could you imagine just the intensity and the zeal? I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this for the God that I serve. I'm doing this for Yahweh. And all of a sudden he gets hit dead on a horse. And a light shines around him and he's knocked down. And all of a sudden he looks up and he says, Lord, Lord, who is this? And God says back to him, it is Jesus whom you're persecuting. What I've learned over the years is that when you mess with God's person, you're messing with God's people. And you're not just messing with his people, but you're messing with God intentional as well. And so I had this, this, this picture up here. I don't know if they're going to bring it up. It's the battle of Kruger Pass is messy. But up there at the top, there's these buffalo. Those are water buffaloes at the top. You can see a little horn figure. At the bottom there is a lioness. And in the middle, though, you can't see it, but it's also a baby uh, a, a water buffalo, a baby calf there. And so here's the story. I, I need you to track with me on this. The water buffalo are minding their business, and they're walking, right? They're going on their own path. But in the way, there's a pride of lions waiting on them, lurking in the land. They've spotted them a while back. And so what the lionesses are going to do, they're going to rush. They're going to rush this buffalo in their herd, and they're going to scatter them, and they're going to go after the little baby. And so the little baby, you ever watch National Geographic? Anybody National Geographic? I, I, I get sad watching that stuff. Man, poor animal, man. Why y'all want to just eat up the baby <laughs> buffalo? And so the buffalo, he's, he's scared. He don't know what to do. And so all of a sudden, he breaks away from the herd, and it's just him by himself. And he's running, and all of a sudden, the lioness pounces on him. But he's pretty slippery, so he slides down into the, 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 the water there, the water hole, and he's down in the water hole. You can, you can Google this, uh, Kruger Pass. You got to do it. And so he slides down in there, and all of a sudden, as he's down, anybody have a bad day before? Like, it, just, it starts off bad, and then it gets worse? His little buffalo is having a bad day. So the, the lion has got him, so he's in the water, and all of a sudden, the crocodile comes up and grabs the other leg. So he's hanging in between. You watch it, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, my gosh, the baby's not going to make it. It's lamb chops tonight for somebody. So I'm sitting there watching it. And so you got this baby in between lioness's mouth and the crocodile's mouth. Who's going to win? And I'm watching this. And all of a sudden, you see this pride, this herd of buffalo just come out of nowhere. All of them. And they, the lion sees it and lets go. And there he's freaking out. And all of a sudden, the crocodile sees it and lets go. And that's just like God, isn't it? That when you mess with one of us, you're going to mess with all of heaven is going to be on our side to get us out of our situation. And so that's happening with Saul right now. All of a sudden, all of heaven is coming down on him because he's persecuting the church. 
And so we can be self-righteous all we want. We can mock people. We can laugh at people. We can get mad at people because they raise hands and because they shout hallelujah and they praise the Lord. But what I've learned a long time ago is when I see a man or woman acting that way, I don't know what's really going on in their life, but I know not to mess with them. I know not to make fun of them because I know that God's got their back. And that praise and that thanksgiving that they're shouting and letting go, something significant is happening in their own soul. They're getting free from that lion. They're getting free from that crocodile. So I'm just going to go ahead and step back and join in on that praise and help that man or woman get free in their circumstance, in their situation. And so a lot of times I don't judge. Just like that biker, I never judge. You know what? God does something that's pretty unique too. the same people you judge will be the same people he'll use to reach. And so I'll back up after that story of getting to know that biker a little bit. And now I'm a pastor and I'm standing over a 16 year old's grave and I'm doing this funeral. Now, how did I get there? The little girl fell off the back of a motorcycle, wasn't wearing a helmet and she died. And so I get this call as a pastor back in Nashville in my church. And I didn't realize that there was a guy in the church, him and his brother, who owned the largest Harley Davidson dealership in North America. Both of them do. And he says, hey, man, my niece, she died. Would you come do the funeral? And now me, you know, I'm looking at him like, wait, 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 wait. Don't you know who I am? I'm kind of like black. And you kind of like white. How's this going to work out? I don't care. You're my pastor. Come stand over and preside over this funeral and love on my family. Now I get there. Now I'm the only chocolate chip in the cookie dough. <laughs> and I'm ministering. And you never know who's watching. You never know who's paying attention as you're ministering to someone that don't look like, that don't talk like, that don't act like. All of a sudden, there's the niece and nephew or the nieces watching with her fiance. And they're saying, how you handled my family? What you did and you showed love and you showed respect for my cousin that was now gone on to be with the Lord. Because of what you did, I want you to preside over our wedding. Now, what business does a man of color have going places like that? What it is is this, is that when you understand who Jesus is and how Jesus operates, how you used to be is going to change when you encounter the true one and only living God. So you may have grew up not liking or talking bad about somebody, but the same thing that you look down on is the same thing God's going to use you to reach. Proverbs 24, 15 says this, do not interfere with good, uh, good people's lives. Don't try to get the best of them. No matter how many times you trip them up, God, loyal people don't stay down long. Soon they're on their feet while the wicked end up flat on their faces. And so here it is. God will make the wrath of man praise him. See, Saul was full of wrath, full of rage. I'm going to get those men. I'm going to get those women. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to get them. And all of a sudden now he's flipped around and he goes from being Saul. Now he's Paul and he's giving God praise. Now he's being used by God. Now, people think, man, when he got, you know, blasted in the head, God smacked him. Anybody been smacked in the head by God? Smacked him off the horse. People say, man, that's the time that Paul changed his name. No, Paul and Saul the same name. It's no different if I was a Latino man and my name was Roberto. <laughs> and I came to the States. What do you think they're going to call me? Robert. That's exactly right. <laughs> so there we go. So it's the same name. It's just a different place. Thank you. <laughs> my last point is this is not what you know. It's, it's who knows you. He was an educated man, wasn't he? Studying under Gamiel, educated, knew the Sanhedrin, knew the high priest, educated, know somebody. But you know what? There was one watching over him that was knew him by the name of Jesus. Do you know that Jesus is watching? And I want to say this. God loves a big mouth. You got a big mouth? I had a big mouth. Oh, yes. I would stand up, man, and tell everybody what we getting ready to do. Man, tonight is the night, baby. 
we're going to go do this, and we're going to go do that, and we're going to blah, 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 blah. Oh, but we're going to go here. We're going to do all these things, and God is like, oh, I can, I can use that. Ooh, he bold. Mm-hmm. Just running out there, telling everybody where they're going to go, where they're going to do and everybody's following. I can use that. And you know what? God used it. Smack me off my horse on my way to Damascus and flip some things around. See, the Bible says this in Psalms 139, 14. Thank you for making me so fearfully and wonderfully com complex. You know we're complex people? Okay, maybe you're not. I am. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. How well I know it. See, God knows the inner workings. He knows those things. He knows what's coming. He knows the beginning from the end and the in between. He knows exactly the moment you're going to get right. He knows exactly the moment of how to do it. You remember y'all was running from God, self-righteous, full of pride, full of arrogance. I'm going to do it my way. I got it all figured out. I'm going to marry him. I'm going to marry her. I'm going to go where I want to go and do what I want to do. And God's no, 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 no. I got something for you. And he comes in and he shifts some things around says that he, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. See, he made you for a certain task. See, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpieces. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. See, there's some things that God has planned for you and I to do. And we can fight all we want. We can hook and crook all we want. We can look down on people all we want. We can say, I'm too good for that all we want. But I'm here to tell you today, I'm, 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 I'm a part of a church that likes to go there. I'm a part of a church that likes to get in, the, get in and, and, and rub shoulders with the asylum seekers, likes to get and go out to Rikers Island and minister to those in prison. I'm a part of a church that loves to get on the campus and preach the Lord Jesus Christ to people from different uh, uh, backgrounds and ethnicities. I'm, I'm a part of a church that want to go put wells in, in places where people don't have water. I want to be a part of a church that is not playing games, that wants to be used by God. That's how I want to be. So I had to get knocked off the prideful horse and get on God's horse and let him ride me and take me where he wants to take me. People say, you know, well, what about this Paul guy? You know, let me tell you, Paul had no idea what he was getting ready to do. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, Paul wrote 13 of them. I need you to feel that 13 books of the 27 books in the New Testament, Paul wrote them. It says that Paul also was a martyr. See, the same person he mocked and laughed at and made fun of and, and, and put to death, Stephen. Could you imagine the Holy Spirit just presiding over that saying, you too will die the same way? You too will preside and die the same way, Paul. And he did. He was beheaded in Rome because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand that we are not, can't be self-righteous, that we're righteous in the eyes of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he makes it all right. And that we can't earn salvation. See, one of the reasons they were doing what they do, and they thought, man, if I do this, then I'm going to get that. This is going to make God happy and help me get into heaven. Man, God, I don't need you. What Jesus did on the cross, he did it. It makes a way for you and I to get there. We don't have to work for nothing. We just receive by faith that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and will be saved. I don't know where you are today. Self-righteous, full of pride, arrogant, looking down upon. Or are you going to be righteous in Christ and say, Lord, not my will, but your will and not my ways, but your ways. And one of the ways that we are made righteous is through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so if you have one of these here, this communion, we're going to take communion right now. The Bible says that. Before we take communion, we're called to check ourselves, to search our hearts, to make sure that we are taking this in a worthy manner, worthy manner. And so while you are sitting there right now, I want you to just begin to 
take care of it, take an inventory in your own heart, in your own soul, and find out what's going on between you and God. Righteousness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. What Jesus did on the cross gives us the ability to draw near to Christ. Draw near to the Father, excuse me, boldly to the throne of grace to find help and mercy in a time of need. But it also doesn't just draw us to him and it draws us to one another. It breaks down that wall just like he tore down that, that uh, the, tore down the, the veil and made a way for us to get to him. He's tearing down walls as well. Republican and Democrat, he's tearing down walls, tearing down walls of ethnic, ethnicities that African Americans and, and, and whites and Asians and Latin Americans and people from the Caribbean and people from all over the world, the Middle East, we can, we can come together as one. That we don't have to judge and look down upon and make fun of and, well, you know, that's them and they. No, it needs to be us and we. And so, Lord, I ask that in this hour that you would forgive us. Forgive us, Lord God, for all sin and all iniquity, all unrighteousness, all unholiness, anything that we've said, done, or thought that would grieve you, Holy Spirit, forgive us. God of our pride and our arrogance, elitism, walking past someone, not talking to someone, not entering someone's home because of the color of their skin or their background, Father, forgive us. Jesus, make us more like you. How you were able to sit down with sinners. How you were able to hang out with the poor. You weren't afraid. You could care less of what people said or thought, Jesus. You more concerned about what the Father was saying. Make us more like you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Can we stand to our feet? Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken. We thank you, Lord, that your body was broken. And you said in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, that by your stripes we're healed. Thank you for healing. Lord, you said in Galatians 3, 13, Jesus, you became a curse to break the curse. Yes, the curse of the law, but all curses. Generational word. Lord, we thank you for those curses being broken. God, I thank you right now for the nail-pierced hands nail pierced feet, the crown of thorn to your head, the lashes to your back. God, thank you, Lord, for the sword to your side. Thank you, Jesus, for standing up on that cross and not getting down. Thank you, Jesus, that you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Thank you, Jesus. And we do this this morning in remembrance of you. Let us take the bread. And now the cup, the cup of the new covenant, symbolizing the blood of Jesus, the blood that cleanses us from all sin, past, present, and future. The blood of Jesus that breaks the power of death, hell, and the grave. The blood of Jesus that says that covers from sin. Thank you, Lord. It gives us access to the throne of grace that we may find help and mercy in the time of need. And Lord Jesus, we say it, we need you. We need you more than ever. More of you and less of us. Let us take the cup. Now Lord, we thank you. We thank you right now, God, that we're gonna make this decree in the... Yes, God, we're gonna make this decree right now in the name of Jesus, that this holiday will be your holiday. That, Lord, we're going to make sure to keep you at the forefront, that Jesus is the reason for the season. That we're not going to go out and just worry about presence, and we're not going to worry about this, that, and the other. No, we're going to keep the main thing. The main thing is all about you. And so, God, I pray to this morning that, God, that you would just continue to move over this congregation. Lord, as we were singing this morning, God, I just sense that there are people in this room that need a mighty breakthrough. There are people in this room that are saying, man, God, if you don't show up, I'm not going to make it. 
And Lord, I'm asking you right now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would come like a mighty rushing wind and begin to blow out the darkness. Blow out anything that is not of you. God, I'm asking right now, blow out the doubt and the unbelief. Blow out the fear. Blow out the anxiety. Blow out sickness, infirmity, and disease. Holy Spirit, come in a mighty way right now in the name of Jesus and be the bomb of Gilead in this place. God, we need you. We need you, God. And Lord, I'm praying right now that the joy of the Lord will be our strength this holiday. That real joy would come in the house, not just singing about it, but it's tangible. It's tangible in our apartments. It's tangible in our homes. It's tangible. The joy of the Lord. God, we praise you. We thank you right now that you're doing something inside of us. Lord, no longer are we going to look down, but we're going to look up. And we're going to be vessels and instruments of righteousness for the Lord Jesus Christ this holiday season and going into 2024. So, God, we praise you this morning. Can we give God praise this morning? Can we begin to clap our hands? Can we begin to say thank you, Jesus? Can we begin to praise him like the blessing is already happening in your life? God, I bless you. This, I give you praise. I exalt you. I magnify you. Come on now. He's been too good. He's been too good. God, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thank you right now in Jesus' name for bonuses coming in this holiday season. I thank you right now in Jesus' name for promotion coming in this holiday season. People have been working hard. And I pray that you would shine your light on each man and each woman. God, that, have, that has worked hard, that has gone above and beyond, that your light would shine in such a way the boss says, I got to bless this man. I got to bless this woman. I got to bless this family because of how hard they've been been working promotion let it come from the Lord let it not come from the man God we thank you praise your name and I thank you for healing in this house we're going to put the devil on notice no sickness no infirmity and no disease this holiday season when we gather there's not going to be any colds there's not going to be any sickness there's not going to be any of that in our homes our babies are going to be well our husbands and wives are going to be well. Our children are going to be well this holiday season as we gather. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we praise your name. We thank you for a shout in the house this holiday season. As we lift up your name and we celebrate your birth. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen.